This word is common enough that it's fairly easy to come up with some kind of working definition that we can use to maybe start to understand where people are coming from when they use it. That is until you stop to think about it for more than a few minutes. Unbiblical is a label that pretends that it's really simple and easy to understand, but it's really remarkably complex. Before we can just declare that something's biblical or unbiblical, there are a lot of steps that you have to go through first. Which translation am I using? Is the translation I'm using accurate? Are there any textual variants of the passage that I'm reading? Do they affect the meaning? What genre of literature am I reading? Is it, is it poetry, prose, history, biography, none of the above? When was it written? To whom was it written? What was it written to address? Is this passage figurative or literal or allegorical? What cultural beliefs of the time influenced the author? How should the author's culture affect my reading of it? What was the political climate at the time of its writing? What uh, hermeneutical framework can I apply here? Are there other methods of literary analysis that I should be aware of? There are just so many things that go into understanding the meaning of a text, and yet I think that sometimes we as Christians can get a little too comfortable throwing around the word unbiblical. So let's talk about it. up, I was taught that we're supposed to believe Bible-based things, live by a Bible-centered ethic, and we're definitely supposed to steer clear of anything that is unbiblical. But that can actually get real confusing real fast. So, so for instance, maybe I'm on a vacation in the Middle East, I come across the city of Jericho. So the biblical thing to do would be to walk around the city every day for a week and just wait for the fireworks, right? I mean, I, I'm technically doing the biblical thing by conquering the city. Uh, it's in the Bible. Okay, that's a pretty easy one to figure out, and honestly, kind of a dumb one, sorry, but, but let's keep looking. Take this passage from Proverbs, for example. Do not answer fools according to their folly, or you will be a fool yourself. Answer fools according to their folly, or they will be wise in their own eyes. So, what's the biblical view of how to answer perceived foolishness. Well, we have two completely contradictory views here in the book of Proverbs. And obviously this wasn't an accident. The writer wasn't trying and failing to come up with a perfectly logical method of dealing with fools that could be universally applied to all situations. Rather, the author is intending for us to understand that these two principles are situational and that we need to use our own judgment and try to wisely figure out which one to apply. Side note, this is a great verse to keep in mind when you're engaging with social media. I've seen many an hour wasted to the compulsion to answer anyone who is wrong on the internet, but that's neither here nor there, back to the topic at hand. So that's just one example that nudges us toward the view that there just isn't a simple, one-size-fits-all method for determining whether something meets a standard of what's biblical or not. So first of all, let's just say that the Bible is not one single document written by a single author. It's a collection of literature. It's a library written by a number of people over the course of a thousand years. So it's really not surprising that it can be difficult to synthesize a single definitive biblical view on a particular topic. But this is often how the Bible is described and used. It's like, it's like there was this single day in history in which God delivered the new international version in its complete form as a black and white answer book down to some guy and then Bible. We don't really have time right now in this episode to go into the entire history of the authorship of the Bible from its pre-written oral period all the way up through the writing of the Gospels and the forming of the canon that would eventually become the New Testament. I mean, it's an immense subject to tackle. We'll bump into some details along the way, but this is a topic that I'm sure that we'll come back to in future episodes. But long story short, let's leave room for nuance. 
I think when you try to compress the Bible down into a single work and into a single point of view, you rob it of, of some of its intrigue, its power and, and complexity. It loses some of its humanity and becomes less relatable. And not to mention, it's just really important to maintain a realistic view of these books. Pretending that the Bible is something that it's not won't give you deeper insights into what it actually says. I mean, it's really just going to do the opposite. Pulling the Bible out of the time and place that it was written is just not the best way to read it. Paying close attention to things like who the original audience was, the genre, the socio-political setting, things like this are essential to understanding what the author is trying to communicate and why they thought the issue was worth addressing. So just to illustrate this point, imagine going to see the uh, Zack Snyder Superman movie, Man of Steel, in the theater a few years back without any knowledge whatsoever of superhero comics or movies or sci-fi or anything like that. I mean, the movie attempts anyway to provide commentary on the superhero genre. So without that background, you're just seeing a really weird movie about a sad, angry alien with a very strange fashion sense who doesn't really seem to stand for anything. I mean, you would have so many questions, right? Like the tights, the the cape, like all the genre conventions that we just accept and understand because we know what comics are. All those things would be a complete mystery. And it's the same thing when it comes to understanding the Bible. I think a great example of this is how Christians have looked at the book of Revelation. I mean, you end up in some bonkers places when you ignore the fact that apocalyptic literature like Revelation was actually commonplace at the time that it was written. The genre has its own tropes and conventions that make reading it and understanding it much easier. I mean, this is how you go from a book written about the political occupation of the land by Rome to Kirk Cameron. Kirk Cameroning, I guess acting is what it's, is that what you would call it? <laughs> Now, I do want to make sure at this point that I'm not just making a straw man argument. I, I'm sure that if you asked most educated Christians, they would be aware of the fact that the Bible comes from different authors and times. But what I'm really trying to zero in on is not necessarily what people say about the Bible, but rather how they treat the Bible. Like I'm, I'm more interested in how their beliefs about the Bible operate. And that's where you get people who will at times acknowledge the diversity of the Bible, but still treat it and act as if it were written by a single hand. And this view of the Bible can make it more difficult to have productive discussions about its meaning. If I'm primed and ready to label any view that doesn't agree with my own as unbiblical and just calling it a day, I'm going to end up with a naive and simplistic view of the Bible's messages. I'm not going to be able to benefit from the rich dialogue that surrounds the Bible as I insulate myself from differing perspectives. You hardly ever go to a bookstore and see just the book of Jeremiah or, or like just the book of Romans on the shelf. And the books, letters, and, and other writings commonly found in the Bible are almost always bound together into a single book. And it's important to remember that that act itself of, of putting all these writings side by side is itself a bit of commentary. A bit of commentary that makes it much easier to see the Bible as just a monologue, a single voice with a single perspective. But it's, it's really Really much more like a dialogue. For centuries, the authors of the writings that would become the Bible wrote about their, their experiences, their thoughts, they created art that we can still appreciate today, and it's all trying to grasp at who God is, all interacting with and commenting on each other's writings, coming at it from, from different angles, different understandings of the world, different political and religious views, and what we have today is that long, extended, in-depth conversation Conversation. There's an ebb and flow, there's, there's disagreement and back and forth between all these different authors. And realizing that makes the Bible much more approachable. It, it brings it to life in a lot of ways. Okay, let's look at the example of James and Paul. If you read the book of James back to back with, say, the book of Romans, you'll notice that there are definitely differences in the way that the two men approach the issue of justification or the process of becoming right with God. James tends to emphasize the role of doing good works, while Paul tends to emphasize the role of faith in Christ. A lot has been written trying to synthesize these two perspectives into one thing. Uh, so let's take a look at these letters and just 
see what we can figure out. Side note, what I've given here is a pretty quick summary of these two perspectives since the theology of justification isn't really the topic of this video. So if this sounds interesting to you, I'd encourage you to do some research on your own. And as always, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them down in the comments. I think it's important to remember that, that these letters weren't written simultaneously or, or even to the same audience. In fact, even though you don't get to a letter written by Paul until the sixth book you come to in your New Testament, Paul was actually the earliest New Testament writer that we have. His works predated the Gospels and other epistles, including James, by several decades. Now, I don't think that James is just flat out disagreeing with Paul on a fundamental level. I don't think the two are diametrically opposed. I think that if you look closely at how each author uses the terms involved, it becomes clear that in some cases they're approaching the same idea from different semantic vantage points. I mean, there are some things that I do think they actually do disagree on, and, and it really does look like they differ in how to interpret certain passages in the Hebrew Bible. But it does seem, at least to me, like what's going on here is that Paul wrote his take on justification, and James is writing in part to address at least how some groups of early Christians came to understand Paul. And this is something I think we can learn from. When you only have one side of an argument, it can be really easy to just run with it and just take it to its extreme and really go off the rails. Early readers of Paul, I think, misunderstood him to be saying that our actions really don't matter. As long as we say the magic words about Jesus, then we can throw any sense of justice out the window. But when you have this dialogue between James and Paul, it gives us a much healthier picture of what it means to live ethically. Care for poor and vulnerable and suffering people is still important. This was a message that Jesus himself spoke about at length, but it was a message that was somehow getting lost in the midst of a complex theological argument. James and Paul are in dialogue with one another, both trying to capture different aspects of who God is and understandably expressing it in different ways based on their own unique experiences. By trying to force the two into a single mold, you end up distorting both of them. You really end up writing your own version of these letters that often doesn't resemble either one. So we can start to see how labeling people with a different view from yours simply as unbiblical, as an excuse not to engage with them, is starting to seem unhelpful at best. And this is something that I think was well understood in particular by Jewish scholars where a spirited discussion and debate as opposed to fiat and enforcement became a central pillar in understanding the Hebrew Bible. There's just a tremendous amount of diversity in opinion. In the Mishnah, for example, you find statements like, Rabbi so-and-so says X, but this other rabbi says Y, and instead of some board or executive just deciding for everyone which one is right, the debate itself is what is preserved and what we can learn from. There's just a much greater sense of comfort with, with the real diversity of thought that we find in the Bible. Christians, on the other hand, don't seem to revel in that debate quite as much. We tend to prefer certainty over discussion. That's why you have options to choose from over 30,000 different Christian denominations that will match your exact theological preferences so you don't have to debate anyone and you can just comfortably worship with other people who think just like you do. But I, I just don't feel like that's the best way to try to understand something as complex as God. We need that debate, that outside push to help us get beyond a surface level Sunday school understanding of our faith. And I think that includes an effort to avoid using the word unbiblical as an epithet or a shorthand for anything that I happen to disagree with. I've noticed that some of the time, not all the time, but certainly some of the time, Christians will use the word biblical to simply refer to the views that they already hold. You know, it's something like, you know, I'm a Christian, I follow what the Bible says, therefore whatever I happen to already think must necessarily be the one true biblical view, or so the argument goes. I think that the error here is that being right about the Bible becomes a part of our identity. 
You know, if you disagree with me about the Bible, you're not just interpreting a text in a different way. You're saying that I'm a bad person, that I'm living an unbiblical life. You're, you're threatening the identity that I've built up. And so we certainly can't debate what the Bible says or engage in conversations where we come to text from our own unique points of view because that would mean that one of us is wrong, unbiblical, sinful, take your pick. You know, it becomes an attack on who we think we are. But I think that one of the great features of Christianity is that our identity isn't bound to a book or a specific interpretation of a book. We can identify with the person of Christ. We can look at, at the life of Jesus, at, at the generosity, the, the loving compassion, the forgiveness and understanding, the desire to promote justice and to take on the manipulative spiritual practices of the religious leadership of the time. We can look at his mercy and his care for the sick and the poor, and that can become what we start to identify with. And it really puts all of our disagreements and bickering into a whole new light one in which we can celebrate and benefit from other perspectives, even when they challenge us. The ambience of love. We all sit in his orchestra. Some play their fiddles, some wield their clubs. Tonight is worthy of music. Let's get loose with compassion. Let's drown in the delicious ambience of love. Hey guys, thanks for watching another episode of Halidom. If you liked what you saw, go ahead and subscribe. That would be great. Uh, like this video, um, hit the bell if you wanna be notified of future videos. One thing that you can do that can really help our channel out is if you actually share the video on Twitter or Instagram or whatever social media platform that you happen to use. Um, feel free to share your experiences, your thoughts in the comments below. We'd love to start a discussion with you guys. But that's all we got for now, and thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next week. Bye.